right. Hello, everyone. Oops. All right, I'm going to share my screen to get us started here. Uh, got some slides to share with folks, and hopefully this will work. All right. Okay. So thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, Eliza, for that nice introduction. And your comments are very apt and appropriate and the perfect uh, preface to the, the things that I'm going to talk about. And, and so it's wonderful to be here today. The, the mission of Sensor with its focus on science for public engagement is, is perfectly aligned with the vision of my own work, as, as Eliza pointed out. And so it is an honor and a privilege to kick this off for, for this summer. So the title of my talk, Rethinking Science Education for the Future is, is really a summary of, of the argument I put forth in my, in my new book, Why We Teach Science and Why We Should. And although my focus is specifically on um, science education at the, at the middle and high school level, it really extends to undergraduate sort of general science education as well. Uh, and, and I think is useful to help us think about why we teach science at all those levels. So hopefully that'll be uh, the case. In the book, I draw on a considerable base of research from the fields of science education and cognitive psychology. And, and, I, and the book itself isn't meant to provide anything new uh, to either of those fields. Rather, what I'm trying to do in the book is to reach a broader policy audience and general reader audience to, to really help people think differently about why we're teaching science and what we're trying to accomplish. The audience for this, what I wanna get at are those people who are who decide what, what happens in, in school science classrooms, the legislative leaders, school board members, community leaders, parents, and even, even teachers. These are the individuals who I would ask and encourage to rethink the science education they're providing to the youth in our schools. And that rethinking involves what I would, what I would call a series of, of challenges to these fundamental assumptions, a set of fundamental assumptions about science education that we make today. Uh, and I start from two distinct sets of ideas. And then I see how they come together and how they might or not might or might not be reconciled with one another. And so the first set of ideas that I focus on, the first part of the book, looks at the purposes of science education. That is the reasons we say science teaching is important. And these would be the, the purported benefits that we think accrue to the individual or society from having students learn science in these K-12 settings, undergraduate general science settings. And the second then is to outline what many of us would consider to be ideal science learning environments, both in terms of, of the content that we're trying to teach and the process of science that we portray in these settings. And then what I'm going to, what I try to do in the book is I put these together to see how the ideal science learning environment matches up to the justifications we offer for science teaching. And specifically, I draw from the relevant empirical research to essentially test these assumptions about what we think science education accomplishes in actual practice. And just to be clear, in outlining these commonly voiced purposes of science education, I'm not assuming that any of you hold these necessarily. My point is only that these are the generally accepted reasons why we teach science in schools, often voiced and written about in policy documents that parents talk about, and even, like I said, practicing science teachers. And, and the same holds true for the ideal science learning environment. It may not be what you think of as the ideal science learning environment, but it's sort of the stereotypical ideal science learning environment. Again, looking at big picture, large grain size here. So I'm going to start with the purposes of science education. Each year in one of the first meetings of the secondary science teaching methods class that I teach, so I run a secondary uh, science teacher certification program here at the University of Wisconsin. And we have this methods class in the fall. And one of the first things I do is I get these students together, all of whom have undergraduate science degrees already, and they want to become science teachers. And so they come here for this 13-month teacher cert program. And I, I get them in their groups and I, and I ask them to come up with what, why, well, what is it we do? Why are we trying to teach students about science? And these students themselves have been highly successful science students and they're committing themselves 
to become science teachers. And so it's really interesting to see what they see as the value of science for, for their students, why they're doing this. And you might not be surprised at the reasons they come up with. This is from my last my class last fall. They list things such as, well, teaching science helps students prepare for careers, improves health and wellness, promotes better decision-making uh, in, in students in their citizen role, develops their problem-solving skills, critical thinking skills, preparation for college science classes, uh, leads to economic prosperity, and so on. And similar lists like these have been developed over the years by a host of science education researchers. One of the most comprehensive is one that George DeBoer came up with in his article on the meaning of scientific literacy. And there he lists what he calls the goals, summary of the goals of science teaching. And you can see there, these are the same kinds of reasons. Teaching and learning about science is a cultural force in the modern world, preparation for the world of work. And his whole list is, I think, nine altogether. And, and you can see those there. And I don't think you'd be surprised by any of those. Now, I've been through these lists again and again. And it seems to me that they can be distilled really into four primary goals or aims or justifications for teaching science. And the four I've come up with are science education for culture, science education for better thinking, science education for utility, that is utility either personally or for the nation as a whole through bolstering our national security or uh, promoting economic prosperity, and science education for democracy, which is particularly relevant these days. To give you a sense of what I mean by these, let me I'm going to take them one at a time. So let's start with science education for culture. What do I mean by that? This is teaching science to convey a sense of appreciation. And it's appreciation of two things in particular, the wonders of the natural world. And so when, when we teach with this in mind, we're thinking about getting students to uh, marvel at the beauty of crystal formation, the profound length of deep time, the amazing adaptations of living creatures and so on. And the second is to get students to appreciate also the ability of the human species to have figured this stuff out, specifically the powers of science and the scientific community to, to provide insights and explanations of the most complex facets of the natural world. So appreciation of those two things, nature and the human ability to reason about nature. Science education for better thinking. This is the idea or belief that understanding how science works or engaging in scientific practice develops certain intellectual skills, things like critical thinking, problem solving, rational analysis, and so on. In this argument, science represents the epitome of rational thought. And so having students do science will therefore contribute to the development of their rational capacity, and particularly outside of science context. So they learn this by doing laboratories, and the idea then is they can apply this in the everyday world. Science education for utility. This goal is focused on the functional value of scientific knowledge. The argument here is that the facts of science knowing the concepts, the theories, things from the various disciplines, things like the particulate nature of matter, the germ theory of disease, conservation of energy, that this knowledge is useful either personally or for the nation as a whole in terms of, say, national security or economic development, like I mentioned before. And the last one, science education for democracy. This one's plain enough. It's the idea that in, in an increasingly scientific and technological world, citizens need to understand the basics of science in order to participate in the democratic process, to make intelligent decisions about how we should collectively live our lives. This one goes back a long way and is frequently invoked anytime science education needs defending and is particularly relevant, I think, to this audience. So these four arguments for science education, I, I group then further by intended audience. You can have those destined for careers in science-related fields. This is what I call the technical training argument. And for those who aren't, the everyday citizen science for general education. And then if you list these across the two audiences, what we end up with, what I ended up with, is the following. Tier one is where society has placed most of the emphasis of late. This is sort of the neoliberal argument. Lots of talk about jobs, getting students into the STEM pipeline, and so on. Um, last December, in fact, the Department of Education convened the You Belong in STEM Coordinating Conference in Washington, 
which launched a Biden administration initiative to strengthen STEM education with the goal of ensuring, quote, 21st century career readiness and global competitiveness. Tier two, these are less frequently invoked, less important. In this tier, the most common arguments center on de democratic participation, usually at the top, and then better thinking, and then trailing off with personal utility and the cultural arguments really have, have sort of shriveled up over the years. I think most of you would agree with this characterization of the reasons we teach science. Of course, you might present them in a different way or have a different order, divide them up, but I think the overlap would be pretty close. These are the things that many people believe a good science education can accomplish. That if we teach science well, we accomplish all of these things. But most of these things are what I would call the myths of science education. And this is where I would really encourage this rethinking to take place. And in the time I have, I'd like to focus on three of these. First, that a crucial purpose of science education is to prepare students for science-related careers. This is the filling the STEM pipeline goal. And, and I think maybe most of you would agree that that's somewhat of a myth. The next two might be a little more challenging. Second, that science education serves an important utilitarian purpose in students' personal lives and in their role as citizens, that knowing the facts of science enables people to get things done for themselves or for society. And third, that science education helps students develop better thinking skills, particularly that doing science promotes critical thinking and problem solving. Of course, Bad science teaching, having students just memorize a lot of science content isn't going to accomplish any of these goals, though, unfortunately, that's what a lot of science education is these days. But again, most would argue that a high quality science education can indeed result in these outcomes. So what might a high quality science education look like? So this is the second part of that pairing I was talking about. If you ask science teachers, concerned parents, school board members, and even science policymakers, they would say that the focus should be on sort of this set of goals, learning the key scientific ideas, core disciplinary ideas in a deep way, the ability to solve canonical textbook problems. Can students balance equations in a chemistry class? Can they calculate the final velocity and distance of a projectile? Solid hands-on work in the laboratory. And if we're looking at high quality school science programs, these would include a variety of AP science course offerings, advanced placement course offerings, courses that offer experience with cutting edge engineering technologies or biotech, and in the best case scenarios, even research opportunities for students or research apprenticeships in local laboratories. These are all the hallmarks of what many would consider a high quality science education. In fact, one of the suburbs just outside of Madison, here where I live, recently built a $190 million state-of-the-art high school and, and implemented almost exactly this science education program for their students. In other words, and here's a picture of that high school, in fact, uh, this is, in other words, the kind of science program that well-resourced middle and upper middle income class communities create when given the opportunity. And they trot out the three myths of science education to justify their efforts. You can see it right on their web pages. So let's take a closer look at these. So first, the technical training argument. The statements about the importance of science education for building the American workforce of the future are nothing new. Such calls have been made again and again since the 1980s, when the Nation at Risk report sounded the alarm over American students getting bested by uh, students from Japan and South Korea. These arguments were made again two decades later in Thomas Friedman's best-selling book, The World is Flat, in 2005. Uh, and here the concern was that, that China and India were outpacing the U.S. in the race for technical talent. And it was from this book where the NRC report, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, came out, which directly led to the America Competes Act of 2007 that promoted the widespread adoption of advanced placement science and math courses in the nation's high schools to meet the challenge. Now, all this seems sensible enough. Science is the engine of technological innovation, which drives economic growth. And schools are not producing enough students ready to enter the STEM career pipeline. The 
problem is that this is only half true. Although science may very well be the foundation of economic prosperity, the claim about a persistent shortage of students in science is pretty far off the mark. Yet this misperception represents one of the predominant myths that drive science education, the idea that we desperately need, need more scientists and engineers to ensure our economic competitiveness. So to illustrate, let's look at the numbers. If you start with an incoming class of ninth graders in the United States, as I represent in this graphic, and so each individual represents 1%. These are all beginning freshmen in high school in the U.S., According to the most recent data from the National Center for Education Statistics, about half will go on to earn an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. So, so associate's degree or higher, half the students earn that. And of all the associates and bachelor's, so an associate's degree is a two-year degree, bachelor's degree, four-year degree. And of all those degrees awarded, about 27% are in science or, or science-related categories. And so this, using a very broad definition, includes things not just like biology, chemistry, physics, but degrees in agriculture and natural resources, biomedical sciences, engineering, engineering technologies, health professions, related programs. So it includes degrees in everything from, from agriculture to nursing and dental hygiene. That means that in any given cohort of ninth grade high school students, only about 13% go on to earn any sort of science-related degree by their late 20s. So small as that percentage is, studies show that it's over double the percentage of individuals who end up actually working in a science-related occupation. One recent study looking at bachelor's degrees in STEM fields found that Colleges historically produce between 40 to 100% more STEM graduates than are hired into STEM occupations each year. And this is no one-off study. Data from multiple sources, the Census Bureau, Department of Commerce, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics all easily affirm- I'm Rana at an institute, though. <laughs> all easily affirm this finding about the overproduction of degree holders in science and science-related fields. Um, to give you a, a, a picture of this, this is a recent graphic in the Census Bureau they put out. And on the left side of the circle are all the degrees uh, in STEM fields. And they include, they start at the top there with computers, mathematics, and statistics, and then engineering, physical sciences. And then at the bottom, they include social sciences, which I don't focus on that much, but they, they include that in their list of STEM degrees. On the right are all, all the occupational fields, not just STEM. At the top, right are just the STEM occupations. And you can see then um, the colored pathways indicate students who have gotten a degree in one of the fields and gone into any STEM occupation. So for engineering, you can see there about half go into a, get a degree in engineering and end up in a STEM occupation, not just engineering, any STEM occupation. And then the grayed out areas are students who end up outside of the STEM occupations. Physical sciences, you can see maybe 20% get degrees in the physical sciences and end up in a STEM occupation, and it decreases from there. Biological sciences, maybe 10%. So when all this is taken into account, the fraction of ninth graders who end up earning science-related degrees and working in science-focused occupations gets whittled down to a mere 7% of all high school graduates. 7%. That means in a typical ninth grade science class of 25 students, one or maybe two students will end up becoming engineers or dental hygienists or respiratory therapists. Yet the myth of science and engineering shortages continues to shape what happens in our science classrooms, resulting in more and more emphasis on student mastery of science content knowledge, the introduction of more hands-on laboratory work, and a growing footprint of advanced placement, biotech, in engineering courses and school curricula in an effort to increase rigor and feed the STEM pipeline. And the next generation science standards is right in line with this. These are the standards that have been developed beginning in 2012 for uh, secondary science education in the US. And they strongly emphasize disciplinary content and student immersion in the practices of science and engineering 
for the reason, their very reason they give on their website is for economic innovation. They say it depends on a broad foundation of science and math learning. The resulting technical training science education experience, that tier one group that I was talking about, however, does little to meet the needs of the 93% of students who are not going on to earn post-secondary science degrees and end up working in a science-related field. It's hard to imagine a greater mismatch between this framework and the students and families actually served by public education. So that's the first myth. Of course, now many would argue that science education isn't just about jobs, of course, that a rigorous science education focused on the facts, concepts, and theories of biology, chemistry, and physics and their associated practices does far more than just prepare students for the 21st century workforce. And the belief here is that knowledge of scientific facts, how the world works, that these things are actually just useful in everyday life, either for personal use, things like knowing how to get a stain out of your pants, for example, or making decisions about various science-related social issues, whether to buy an electric car, wear a mask during a pandemic, or support a candidate pledging to take on climate change. I would argue this is another myth, unfortunately. Why is this a myth? First off, research shows that few of us remember the material taught in our high school science classes. In one study, for example, researchers from MIT found that senior physics majors scored 60% lower on a written assessment of material they learned four years earlier during their freshman year. The fall off was similar in another study of second year medical students that reported after five to 11 months, students retained only about 60% of the basic science content they learned during their first year. And in both of these cases, these were science majors. Perhaps more damning are the National Science Foundation surveys that reveal most of us don't recall much of even the most basic scientific facts of the world. So this is the national, this is the Science and Engineering Indicators Report from the National Science Board since the 1970s, this has come out every other year biannually, and they do a, a science content uh, assessment of the general public. And what they find routinely is that fewer than half of the general public, for example, know that electrons are smaller than atoms, and almost a quarter believe that the sun goes around the earth and not the earth around the sun. The public doesn't know very much. Okay. Science content is taught largely in isolation from the everyday problems and experiences of students. It simply doesn't meaningfully intersect with how people live their lives, as most of you know. The days go by just the same, whether it's the sun orbiting the earth or the earth orbiting the sun. Students simply don't retain the facts they're taught. So how could they be useful? That's one of the key reasons. And even if people do remember some of the science they've been taught, they rarely use it to make everyday decisions. Think about it. If you need to get a stain out of a pair of pants, are you going to think back to your high school chemistry class? And even if you do, will you remember what you learned back then? Or will you see what stain removing tips you can dig up on YouTube? Or perhaps you'll ask a friend or a relative. You'll call your mom, perhaps. If the decision involves public policy, things get even more challenging. The problems in that realm are so much more complex. We're talking about things like climate change, global pandemics, human gene editing local land use decisions, and so on. There are hundreds of science-related social issues like these that require some form of democratic deliberation for their resolution. All are just as, if not more complicated than the everyday personal decisions that we make. So where does school science content knowledge fit in all this? It, it doesn't really. Over the past 20 years, Over the past 20 years, studies in science education have shown that when people are asked to deliberate over socio-scientific issues, they rely primarily on social, moral, ideological, or ethical factors in coming to a decision. Here I'm drawing on research from folks like Troy Sadler, Karen Rudsberg, and Bill Sandoval, among others. 
Although individuals may, in rare circumstances, use school science content knowledge if they're explicitly prompted to or immediately following instruction, more typically, they don't have the science content knowledge ready at hand to apply, find the relevant content difficult to make sense of, or don't see its relevance to the problem at all. Rather, they proceed intuitively without deliberate rational analysis, invoking personal affective criteria and arriving at what they think is an appropriate resolution to whatever problem they're facing. Research in the field of science communication has reached the same conclusion, finding that scientific literacy defined as knowledge of science content has only a limited role in shaping public perceptions and decisions. Researchers have shown time and again that people are much more likely to rely on their social networks than on their high school science knowledge. And when it comes to things like climate change, vaccination, and energy policy, political affiliations and what your friends and family think trump what's in your biology and physics textbook. In fact, there's some really interesting work done by Yale researcher Dan Kahan, who found that knowing more science content, in fact, correlates with greater levels of political polarization. In, in a really interesting study, here's a graphic from that. He found higher levels of scientific literacy resulted in correct answers to fact-based questions. Those are the ones on the left. If the question is what gas do most scientists believe causes temperatures to rise, both liberals and conservatives get it right the more science content they know. But when questions ha have a political dimension, higher levels of scientific literacy resulted in greater polarization. And you can see the divergence when they ask, is, is uh, the earth warming caused by human activity? So what does this mean? Kahan concludes that for ordinary citizens, the reward for acquiring greater scientific knowledge, content knowledge, and more reliable technical reasoning capacities is actually a greater facility to discover and use or explain away evidence relating to their group's positions. So it's commonly known as motivated reasoning. In other words, this shows that social networks matter more than science content knowledge. The belief that knowing science contributes meaningfully to personal and democratic decision-making simply doesn't square with the facts about how individuals actually use science in their daily lives. So this leaves us with the last uh, myth, as I call it, that science promotes critical thinking and problem-solving skills. And, and the most common form this takes is the idea that having students engage in the practice of science is the best way to promote these general intellectual skills. And this is a myth for a number of reasons. And the quick rundown is, first of all, few teachers engage students in scientific inquiry or practice. Second, research experiences, when students do have them, do little to convey the desired understandings about science that we want them to achieve. And third, intensive instruction in scientific reasoning often has little effect. And we can take these in turn. So, Historically, we know that despite all the money spent on the Sputnik era inquiry-based curriculum materials during the 1950s, and here are some of the textbooks that some of you may have seen before. These were developed by NSF-funded uh, researchers, Nobel laureates um, at the time uh, in, in physics, chemistry, and biology. And these all had a, a, a the focus on these curricular materials was to get students to engage in scientific inquiry and understand science as a process of inquiry. But when studies were done to follow up on this by NSF, to gauge the long-term impact of this work, hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on this, they found that most teachers never fully implemented inquiry teaching in their practice, and most, despite this very high-profile push for reform, continued to focus on textbook reading, lectures, and problem sets. And this was work done by Stake and Easley in the, in the 70s. When the national science education standards were implemented in the 1990s, again, inquiry approaches were front and center. That is, there was a hard push to engage students in, in, in scientific inquiry, doing science, yet the results were the same. Studies on the impact of the standards found that the push to hold students accountable to more and more science facts, in fact, forced teachers to abandon inquiry approaches if they ever took them up in the first place. And this was work done by Hallwig and Hill. And more recent studies have found the same. And the reason is the teachers just don't seem to be comfortable teaching this way. Few have had direct experiences themselves 
doing scientific work. And so it's natural that they aren't sure how to engage students in such work. And the fact that there are a few good curriculum materials available to support such work makes it even less likely. And here I'm thinking of the landmark study by Chin and Mel Melholtra that found that none of the curricular materials they surveyed came close to capturing actual scientific reasoning. So what about getting students in real scientific laboratories? And like this is commonly done in summer research experiences, which have become increasingly popular, again, based on this assumption that doing science in these ways will somehow instill the ability to reason scientifically. What does the research say about that? Simply that evidence for the benefits of science research experiences is quite limited. Rather than learning about the development of research questions and how experiments might be designed to answer those questions, students and teachers who do these experiences as well mostly learn things like lab safety, technical procedures, and skills like culturing bacteria, collecting specimens, running data analysis software, and so on more job skills than scientific reasoning. A 2017 report from the National Academy of Sciences on the topic of research apprenticeships concluded that the main outcomes are increasing the participation and retention of STEM students, promoting disciplinary knowledge, and integrating students into STEM culture. That is, such experiences are essentially just a form of professional training or job shadowing there were no positive outcomes associated with better thinking skills reported. So this is still, you're just looking at the tier one technical training goal of science education. Can students be taught how to reason scientifically in intensive, carefully designed instructional settings? Sort of. Studies have shown that under ideal conditions, students can learn some aspects of scientific thinking. But that said, with respect to key features of experimental design, Students typically struggle to create controlled experiments on their own, typically manipulate too many variables at once in a given experimental setup, and cling to prior beliefs in the face of conflicting evidence. In a summary of research on teaching scientific reasoning, and this came out in the Annual Review of Developmental Psychology just in 2020, so it's fairly recent, Stolman and Walker found they concluded that there doesn't appear to be a natural developmental path toward higher levels of scientific reasoning, nor do there seem to be any obvious instructional strategies to help students learn the skills involved. And the challenge is fairly obvious. Developing scientific reasoning in students is difficult because scientific reasoning itself is difficult. The eminent British biologist, Lewis Wolpert, famously made this point in his 1993 book, The Unnatural Nature of Science, explaining that the, that the towering achievements of science are so remarkable just because the thinking that led to them goes against the grain of common sense. But even if we could get students to master the processes of scientific reasoning, it's highly unlikely that this would lead to better everyday thinking, which is the argument that's made that having students do science develops their ability to reason scientifically that then they can apply to their everyday experiences. The reason for this is that the natural thinking that people engage in on a daily basis that Wolpert talks about in this book operates with a completely different set of cognitive skills and dispositions. People approach everyday problems using intuitive shortcuts, heuristics, and emotions that are largely tacit and invoked unconsciously. We make gut level decisions often without stopping to reason through all the possible problem solutions. And if we do stop to engage in a careful, rational analysis, such efforts are overwhelmed by emotion and personal bias. And we see, we see this all around us. The lay public has always relied on this intuitive, gut-level, moral reasoning, and over 130 years of formal science education hasn't changed that. In fact, it's this continued reliance on intuitions rather than hard evidence that's resulted in the very problem we currently have, that it seems to make sense that doing science, the ultimate rational enterprise, will result in better thinking skills. This is what we intuitively believe, but it just isn't the case. So to recap, career training, everyday utility, and critical thinking skills, skills that 
are believed to be essential for democratic decision making. These are the myths currently driving science education in this and most other countries. Except the science education we have in our middle and high schools in particular, heavily focused as it is on content mastery and technical training, is useful for almost none of these things. We don't need more scientists and engineers. People don't need detailed science content knowledge to solve their everyday problems. And folks just aren't very good at making carefully thought out rational decisions. To put it in terms of the original purposes of science education, we can effectively cross these things off our list. So is exposing these myths an argument against science teaching in schools? Absolutely not. A look around us tells us this can't possibly be the case. The challenges of global pandemics, climate change, safe water supplies, and countless other science-related social issues are beginning to overwhelm us. Surely we need some understanding of science in our modern society. But ratcheting up the rigor, teaching more science facts, concepts, and theories, and having students do more science or engage in science and engineering practices and in school lab experiences isn't gonna do the trick. Going faster along the same rutted path we've been on since the middle of the last century is gonna only leave us stuck in the end. But if science education can't do what we thought it could, and the empirical evidence certainly seems to confirm that it can't, what can it do? What is science education actually capable of? And I believe the key to answering this question lies in giving up our vision of the rational individual and acknowledging the role of expertise in the modern world. So what does that mean? First, we need to recognize that scientific expertise is an inescapable fact of modern life. The late science educator uh, Stephen Norris wrote incredibly insightfully about this. There's almost no situation in which individuals can make or have the ability to make first order judgments about whether a scientific claim is valid or not. Scientists themselves rarely feel confident reviewing research outside their areas of expertise. And I've seen this in my role as the editor of, of the journal Science Education as well, asking people to review articles that they say, oh, I, I'm really not qualified. If that's the case, how on earth can we expect the average person, no matter how many school science courses they've taken, to be able to determine whether some scientific sounding claim they've read in the news is legitimate or not? And that's an argument people make. Well, we need people to be able to read an article in the newspaper and and, and tell whether that's, that's something that they should believe or not believe. They, they can't do it. As Norris wrote, non-scientists are inescapably dependent for their scientific knowledge upon scientists. Whether or not something counts as scientific knowledge is not a decision that non-scientists are in a position to make by themselves. All they can do is rely on experts to help them understand and make their decisions. And no amount of science content knowledge or school science lab work is going to change that basic fact. I would argue that, that we need to imagine a new goal for science education, building public trust, which builds on and extends the goals of democracy and cultural appreciation. We need a science education that addresses the troubling tendency these days to mistrust and discount scientific expertise in areas where expertise matters tremendously. And two key shifts in science education, I think, are necessary if you hope to realize this goal. First, let's get rid of the focus on facts and technical skills that are only relevant for the 7% of students who will go on to science-related careers. Let's teach instead how those facts are made. Let's focus on how scientists come to know what they know about the natural world. That is, we should dedicate ourselves to a renewed focus on the epistemology of science in order to help build public trust. Let's engage students with questions about how do we know that? How do scientists know that? What evidence do they have that supports the key models and theories they have about the various aspects of the natural world? Let's not just teach the models and theories, but what those models and theories are good for and how we can trust those models and theories. What's the evidence base for those? And with this epistemological focus, we should focus also on highlight the diversity of scientific practices in our teaching. And this is a point that's almost completely overlooked. Science isn't conducted according to a single set of practices, contrary to what NGSS would have us think. And it certainly isn't done using some monolithic scientific method, though that idea has had remarkable staying power over the last hundred and so years. 
science is a general way to describe a wide variety of research communities, each of which operates with its own distinct set of practices. The work done in fields such as epidemiology, climatology, experimental physics, evolutionary biology, such fields couldn't be more different from one another in terms of the phenomena being studied, the methods of data collection, what counts as evidence, and the nature of the theories being developed. Uh, there's a nice article by uh, Per Kind and Jonathan Osborne who wrote about styles of scientific reasoning, um, which is worth a read if you get the chance. Let's allow students to look at how science works in these and other fields, not by some false imitation of practice, but by reading about and seeing and talking with the researchers who work in these fields. Understanding the varieties of scientific practice is crucial for disabusing public belief in a single method of science which is often believed that single method, everyone thinks it's experimental and capable of unambiguous confirmation of claims. And anything that doesn't conform to that is easily discounted. That belief is why it's been so easy to undermine public acceptance of things like evolution, climate change, and the cancer-causing effects of smoking, as Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway have shown in their book, Merchants of Doubt. All of these sciences rely on indirect evidence and non-experimental methods. Second, in order to help students face the challenges in our current day, what we need isn't to arm them with some rudimentary set of scientific facts, but rather to help them develop an understanding and appreciation of where science knowledge comes from, how it's funded, and which institutions, and why it can be relied on for making personal and public policy decisions. This is what I call the in teaching about the scientific enterprise in its institutional context. This would mean talking about how are research priorities determined, the role of peer review, how funding sources influence the nature of research that's done for good or for ill, the way scientific research is regulated, who does science, what it takes to enter the profession, and how institutions and agencies like the NSF, the NIH, the CDC, and the FDA function in society. Why is there no place currently in the school curriculum to talk about these agencies that shape so much of our lives and in interactions with science and that are at the very center of our current science society conflicts? It, it, it baffles me. Now, I admit that much of what I'm calling for is well beyond the scope of what we currently think of as science education. Teaching how scientists became convinced that the Earth's surface consists of moving plates is no real stretch from a traditional perspective. A little more historical narrative to go with the details of the current model of plate tectonics is all you need. Looking at the cultural consequences of Galileo's arguments for a sun-centered solar system is a bit more of a lift, but there are good curriculum materials out there that teachers could certainly work from. Taking on questions about the public role in setting research priorities or how scientific institutions function in society, however, would be entirely new and exotic without question. Yet making all these things the focus of instruction, I think, is crucial if we hope to shift public perception of science from being viewed as something outside of society and culture to being viewed as an integral part of it, as something that citizens themselves have a role in shaping as legislators, school board members, community leaders, and voters. With this, we can achieve a dual purpose, science education for culture's sake and for a kind of cultural appreciation that leads to more effective democratic participation. That's my vision. But if there's only one message I'd like you to take away from this talk is that what we're currently doing, certainly at the high school level, isn't working. Our continued focus on science content knowledge and, and just the doing of science, given what we know about how students learn and how people use science in their daily lives, simply makes no sense and more than likely is counterproductive, turning more of the public away from science than inviting them in. It's time we took a hard look at the evidence of what's actually possible to accomplish at scale in science classrooms and build our science education accordingly. And thank you for being here. And uh, I look forward to the conversation and questions and, and whatever else. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now if I can. Uh, there we go. Thank you, John. Oh.